Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending our 10th annual San Francisco Financial Planning Day at the San Francisco Public Library in partnership with the Financial Planning Association of San Francisco. Please note that you can enable or disable closed captions by clicking on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. If you don't see it, just hover your mouse near the bottom and it will pop up. If you have any questions, please contact us by chat, email, or phone. They're listed here on the slide. Um, write them down, mm. but then at the same time, I will be sending out this information um, in a follow-up email. And thank you, everyone, again, for joining us, and please welcome Chris. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us for uh, a, what will be a great conversation about navigating and thinking about the current uh, California insurance crisis. Um, I wanted to share that I myself have actually gone through being non-renewed um, on properties that were fine and also on a property that wasn't in great shape. So this is this is a very stressful, frustrating situation. And Brian is such a great resource um, to be able to present um, what he is seeing right now in the insurance crisis and um, you know, maybe even giving us an idea of, of where he sees this going from here. So I want to introduce Brian Truett. Uh, he has his own insurance agency, Truett Agen uh, Insurance Agency, which he started in 1998. Um, he is a super volunteer. When we had the uh, North Bay fires many years ago, um, he was out helping us in the Financial Planning Association planners to help the folks out in Coffee Park and to gather information and um, to be able to share that with many people. So I'm, he's just a tremendous resource. Um, he works with uh, folks to take a look at where their insurance challenges may be coming from, not just this non-renewal issue, but also how can you better your insurance? Although Personally, it's hard to better your insurance right now, but um, yeah. there's going to be a page that is going to be a takeaway of the kind of areas that he focuses on, and that will be a, available to everybody who's on the call. Um, he grew up working for his family's construction home business, which I think is fantastic because he's it's so much of, of housing insurance is about construction. So I, I think he just comes with a, a fabulous perspective. And here's the most important part. Uh, he lives in Carefree, Arizona. He has two children and four dogs, and also a number of quail and bunnies, which I think is very important to understand. He's a sensitive, lovely man with all of the things around him. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he's also works with the court appointed uh, special advocates program for foster care youth and is a uh, assistant scout scoutmaster. So need I say more about the qualifications of this man to share with us today? Wow, thanks. <laughs> All right, let me share my screen here. Uh, <clears throat> Chris, can you see the screen that has just the blue and there's no Nix thing? I, I can one? see it and it looks like a presentation. All right, yay. All right, so we have a growing insurance crisis in the USA <clears throat> slash California. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, national trends because we really do have a growing national problem. California is unique in its um, its crisis because uh, of a lot of there's a lot of reasons, but our current, current insurance commissioner has a lot to do with it. And if I were going to draw you a diagram of what the insurance planning looks like in California and and where it's going, this is what your diagram would look like. It's a crayon picture. And if, if all the players put their color in this diagram and drew what they thought it looked like, this is how the mishmash would, would work. Um, it is a mess in California right now. There's a lot of people who are advocating for different things. And a lot of people are stuck in their own lanes and those lanes are defined by how they make a living or their personal philosophies. It's a very difficult time in a market that's driven by, um, by revenue. So the, um, <clears throat> the industry nationally is experiencing high loss ratios. So I'm not gonna bore you with like 10 years of data but 22, 23, the industry was over, property and casualty industry was over 100% loss ratio. 
a carrier runs on 30% of their revenue typically. So when you have over 100% loss and you add expense ratio, now you're up into 130% losses. So carrier profitability is a big problem right now. You cannot run a business losing 130% a year of your premium. You know, retail agencies like mine, where we have profit sharing agreements that carriers pay us to do good work. Like, so if we write good business and we grow and we're, we don't have a lot of losses, they share their profits with us and their, their shareholders. We get cut off on profit sharing at 40% loss ratio for every hundred dollars that goes in. If $40 is paid into claims, they're not going to be sharing revenue with us because we're not profitable. So profit is a really big deal across the industry and insurance carrier is only profitable if their loss and expense ratios combined are under hundred percent. It's very important to understand where, where the carriers are right now and in their, what their lane is. Um, let me see. Why all the losses? California in particular, I have crime at the top. For better or for worse, I don't know, you can make form your own opinion about how California deals with crime, but they're not enforcing a lot of crime, you know, a law. So you have people that started with stealing, you know, the $900 at Prop 47 and crime got bigger and bigger. And our crime ratios in California are something like 4,000% from 10 years ago because people don't turn in the... Um, the crimes to the authorities, but they call us when they have their car broken into or their house broken into. So crime is a big driver of costs in San Francisco in particularly. And you know, the rest of California, a lot of places that more the, the more urban the area, the more crime you have. Many carriers are not writing simply because of crime. And an underwriter tell me. They wouldn't touch an Oakland house um, yesterday, even though it wasn't in a fire zone because they don't like the crime exposure. Um, so that's a big deal. Uh, we have to figure that out. If either you people don't mind paying more for insurance because it's a tax on having crime or we, get, we gotta get rid of crime, but you can't have both. Convective storms. Maybe people have noticed in the news in the last, um, month or so that there's been some convective storms hurricanes that have been causing damages that's a national you know east eastern and southern trend but these are affecting the carriers and their profitability and these storms seem to be getting worse there's a lot of talk about climate change or not climate change but whatever it is when you lose billions of dollars on a single storm you've got that money has to come from somewhere we have water issues water is all year long water is comes from pipes inside of a house water comes from wind and roof leaks and you name it water is the number one cause of loss in the insurance business because it's always there some wind you know summer winter spring there's always water somewhere fire i mean we've all heard about the fires in california the whole west has fire issues and these are shock losses like convective storms um, this is manageable, but when you add all of these things together, right, how do you prevent giant wildfires? Well, <clears throat> there's things that you can do, but when you add in water, hail, crime, inflation, you know, people don't think of inflation when they think of insurance, but that me inflation means that everything that gets inflated costs an insurance company more when they have a claim. So our loss ratios are spiking in the industry because of labor shortages and inflation. And we have this, um, when we pay people higher minimum wage, it raises the wages inside of insurance carriers too, because we have to recruit people against those wages. And I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing to pay people the wage that they need, but all of these things are factors that come into um, insurance costs. So, and the other thing about labor shortage is this, we have a a generation of people that didn't want to go into technical work like plumbing and electrical and those types of jobs. And so we're finding that contractors are getting fewer and farther between as a generation is retiring. And so knowledge, there's knowledge gaps. And so we end up with anything from having to wait for a contractor for six months to a contractor who doesn't know what he's doing, create a construction defect and then having to fix that claim too. So everything, um, these are real factors in, in insurance to be aware of. 
you know, an auto and safety tech, like, you know, a Toyota Camry, if you have a front end collision on a Toyota Camry, even a low level collision, that's a five or $6,000 claim now compared to say 10 years ago, where it might've been 500 to $750 because the cars are so safe. I've had claims where, you know, if you looked at the car, you'd think whoever was in that car must've been killed. And in fact, they got out of the car and they were fine because the cars crumple. So from a safety standpoint, it's great. People aren't dying, but from a cost standpoint, from property damage, we're having a lot higher claims. I mean, with under, the more the higher rates go, the more uninsured people are around. And auto and home, both, the more people who are un, uninsured, the higher the costs are for the insured people. So these are these are factors that are that are all working together across the United States, but particularly in California, when you put in that crime, it's a it's a really big deal. Um, soft causes, <clears throat> so. In insurance in its basic form is an, an investor is buying risk. So someone who has the money to invest says, I'm going to bet that your house isn't going to burn down. And you go out to buy insurance because you're getting a mortgage and you're betting that your, ins your house is going to burn down, right? You're saying, I want to pay you this money. So if my house burns down, you'll give me the full value of the house. That's what, in that's what insurance really is. So to the right here, we see that traveler stock dives as revenue misses, catastrophe losses top 1.5 billion. That was in July. That 1.5 billion right now is probably more like five uh, because of the recent storms. We just don't have the numbers tallied. This is important to understand because traveler's stock, this is a, w, a Wall Street Journal article. This means that fund managers who are managing your 401k, for instance, or your pension plan, or whatever, wherever your retirement money is, they look at Travelers and Hartford. These are large blue chip type value stocks that, that portfolio managers put in their portfolios for, for revenue. So if Travelers isn't paying out revenue to the fund, the fund managers are going to drop that stock and their stock is going to go down. That means that they're going to be sued by their their board is going to get lawsuits and other stockholders are going to drop the stock and then travelers won't be around for very long if their stock goes down far enough. So travelers is, has pressure from costs and they also have pressure from stockholders. And so the insurance business is integrated very firmly. There's a spider web of cause and effect in the insurance world Everywhere from your 401k down to someone stealing your bike out of your garage in San Francisco, all of these things are related. And so just pulling a string on something that's interwoven like this can unwind everything if you don't really know what you're doing. And that's what's going on right now in the insurance business. So our perception of risk, predictability is very difficult right now. We can't say what's going to happen. Um, I'm going to talk about some legislation in a minute and how that's affected California in particular. But like we see these increased cataclysms and Lahaina, Hawaii. So a lot happened in Lahaina. I followed this uh, claim very closely and we were involved in helping some people rebuild out there. But here's what happened at the end of the day. There was all these winds and it was a terrible situation, but the fire department had put out the fire and then they left for lunch. The fire reignited and burned the town down. So human intervention could have stopped that entire cat catastrophic loss. And everyone just decided they needed to go to lunch and they left. And the same thing happened in Paradise, California, which a lot of people heard of. Massive fire, a lot of deaths. The city had narrowed its roads for so egress into the city and exit from the city were very difficult. They wanted to have a a forest glen type feel to their town and that no one could fight fires. They didn't have any brush ordinances. So these are things that could have been avoided, but actually occurred. And then you have things like Lafayette, Colorado, which wasn't a human problem per se, but that fire occurred on the 30th of December. 
which that isn't even fire season in the West anymore, but now there's not even a time when we don't have fires. So how do you navigate this as a risk manager, as an insurance company? So I wanna be clear that these are things that are in the minds of carriers, how they're, how they're trying to charge for risk and how, where do you put a dollar ratio on something that where a bunch of people could just leave for lunch and burn your town down? Um, anyway, uh, that's the soft causes. And then the California crisis, <clears throat> We really started our crisis in California insurance back in 1988. I was a second year college student, didn't even know um, this was going on. Um, and uh, the commissioner in California, the insurance commissioner is an elected position. And that means that instead of putting a technician in charge of the insurance business, what we have is someone who's using that position to advance politically. Several insurance commissioners have used it to go on to be a senator or a, or a congressman, and several have actually ended their career because they were corrupt and taking money from insurance carriers. And, but what, be that as it may, this is a position that really requires a technician, someone who understands what's going on in the insurance business and how it works. And it doesn't really require a knowledge of insurance. And what we have right now is an insurance commissioner who doesn't really understand the retail markets of insurance, and he doesn't understand business in general. Ricardo Laura has been trying to keep, treat the insurance business in California as a social program, but it really isn't. It's a, it's a financial market. So for rate raises, if you wanna raise your rates, you have to go to the insurance department and you have to say, I have this need. And if it's over 6%, you have to have your whole company audited on a national basis to see if you're really, you know, profitable, you know, in another state, and you're just trying to be profitable in California. So the position of California is that if you're unprofitable here, but you're profitable somewhere else, you know, that's fine. You don't deserve the rate increase. And the carriers are saying, well, if we're not profitable in a place, we're just going to stop writing in that place. And there's something else that's important. The law allows what are called interveners to contest rate changes. So if Hartford uh, or travelers or somebody says, we need a rate increase, these interveners, these legal people are, you know, from consumer advocacy groups like Consumer Watchdog, they're able to challenge the rate increase and they charge their legal fees to the insurance carriers who then can legally charge those off to consumers. So there's a built-in tension between the interveners and their profitability and challenging the rates that the carriers want to have, it's not quite fair because these the guys who are consumer advocates actually make their living on arguing with the insurance carriers that they then pass on to the consumers, which I don't feel like this is a fair situation given the fact that they're always going to be motivated in their lane, if you will, to, to block something from the insurance industry because they are gonna get paid to have that opinion. Um, all of this kind of went along and, you know, kind of like an anchor dragging on the bottom, the bottom of the ocean because carriers were able to raise their rates up to 6% and move rate right around because the way it would work is a carrier could could you know, raise premiums in one spot and lower it in another, it was fine. And then 2017 happened. 2017 was a landmark year for fire. Carriers were paying out $2 for every dollar of premium that they'd collected. The magnitude of claims created these very slow um, response times because we were having to import people from other states and those other states had much lower construction costs than California. So we were having trouble with claim service we got a lot of news, uh, a lot of publicity, and California, California passed three laws. And I'm, I'm not going to get into these laws too much because I teach an entire like two-hour class on this. But they were championed by the current insurance commissioner when he was a senator in California. They increase carrier risk. They increase payout in a declaration of emergency. And the carrier said, hey, if you're going to increase our payout in the declaration of emergency, we need to raise our rates. And when he, the carriers tried to raise rates and he said no, 
they began to non-renew in California. And that's when Laura opposed a moratorium. That went on for a year and then he imposed another moratorium. That drove a lot of investor money out of California. When investors realized that they could be buying risk in California, but be stuck here for an indeterminate period of time, it, the market for risk dried up completely. And that's where the uh, that's where this crisis really began because of these laws and because of the carrier beginning to withdraw. So this was a crisis back in, in 2018 when these laws went into effect. And in 2019, that's when Ricardo Laura took office uh, for his first term. June 2023, these are the current, I'll take you up to current events here. June 2023, Ricardo Laura has a has a press release and he says, you know, the pro real problem is carriers aren't telling me what they need for rate. And if they're honest with me, I'll do it. We really all need to work together. And so AIG had requested an 80 percent increase on their book and they were denied. He said, absolutely not. AIG exited California. But we all watch what's going on between all the carriers and State Farm watched AIG exit California. AIG is a specialty company that serves like high net worth families. And so people really didn't notice AIG leaving that much. But State Farm watched that happen. And when they required, when they asked for a 30% increase and Ricardo Laura denied it, two days after that, they began their non-renewals in California. And so it was 72,000 homes um, in uh, May of 2024, State Farm started renewing. State Farm has said they're going to do another million homes next year if they don't get the rate increase that they've asked for. So State Farm is the largest insurer in the state of California with about a 35% market share. If they drop a million homes, it's going to throw California into total chaos. I'll talk about why that is in a minute, but State Farm is an extremely powerful position and Ricardo Laura does not understand that he cannot regulate them to stay in the state. He can only regulate the laws. He just doesn't get it. So in September of 2023, Ricardo Laura says, I urgently am going to come up with this sustainable insurance strategy. This has gone far enough and you know, the state, people can't refinance homes and they're losing their insurance. And the insurance is not affordable, so we're going to create the sustainable insurance strategy September 2023 to be unveiled in December 2024. So he gave himself this amount of time to work on it. He should have started working on this in 2019 when everyone who knows insurance was saying, hey, this is an emergency. We should do something. The details are very opaque, but his signature feature on this is that 85% of new business with carriers has to be written in high risk areas. That's not going to happen. That'd be like taking all the money that you have and putting it on one stock or buying um, high yield bonds that are very unstable or something. The higher the risk, the more you can lose money. Carriers that are looking at their stock prices are not going to be writing 85% of their business in places where they could have billions of dollars of loss in a single day. So, this is kind of where we're at right now in California. Everything is being pushed to the California Fair Plan. It's growing exponentially. It's very limited coverage. You have to, it's smoke, fire, and lightning. You have to purchase a second policy to make it work. A lot of carriers have fled that market because California forced carriers to pay flood claims a few years ago that weren't covered. It's a long story, but Carriers are distrustful of the way California runs its market. So a lot of the national brand carriers have left the market uh, that writes the DIC difference in conditions policies that are companion to the fair plan. So we're having little carriers coming into California that have very small market caps that may disappear if they have a you know bad year in California. It's limited to 3 million aggregate. So it's not very difficult to have $3 million of home replacement costs, loss of use and contents in California because it's such an expensive place to build. Um, so this is a very, this policy is not working for a lot of people. It's backed by the California carriers ostensibly, but it's growing so exponentially that the carriers are beginning to shrink their footprints. So the carriers that back it are shrinking and the 
policies in the fair plan are growing. So there's this looming insolvency issue going on with the um, fair plan. That's a really big deal because we can kick the can down the road on like deficits with the state or deficits with the federal government, but you can't kick the can down the road when someone's house burns down, they need their house rebuilt and they need a place to live. So there's no can to kick here on this slide. The fair plan must bring itself to solvency. Something's gonna have to happen. And I'm not sure what that's going to be given the, the market conditions, but these are things that you need to know. Carrier responses- Hey Brian, again, I've, got a, I've got a quick question, sorry. Yeah, and I don't sure. even know if you know the answer to this, but would the state of California ever stand up behind the bringing it to solvent? A lot of people, yeah, a lot of people believe that that's what's going to happen. But then my question is, where does the money come from? Right. I mean, California spent itself from a $97 billion uh, surplus in what, 2023 or 2022 to a $67 billion uh, deficit in 2023. And then that doesn't even include their, include their unfunded pension liability. Where's the money going to come from? Like they spent Elon Musk's entire net worth in one year and they'd have nothing to show for it. I was just drove up 19th Avenue yesterday and it's exactly the same road that it was when I was in college back in 1988. So that's, you know, where's the money come from? I don't know. Um, so we have these cost increases. We have uh, where carriers can increase costs. They are rationing. So, Safe Code Liberty Mutual last year had 1,600 agencies in the state of California. They now have 600. They dropped that all these agencies. And when they drop an agency, they drop all their clients too. So they're non-renewing all, the, all of the clients that were with those agencies to get to shrink their home books. Those are all the agencies that were not profitable to that carrier. So they were writing bad business. They're limiting the number of new business packages. We can write one package per month with travelers and Safeco in our agency. There's 600 agencies in Safeco and in California, and they can each write one package auto home a month. That's not going to absorb the million policies that State Farm is talking about dropping. Tighter underwriting, it's clean business only. So if someone has a theft claim or a water claim, we can't even submit it. Um, they're forcing multiple lines. So if we cannot write anything standalone with our carriers any longer, we have to write auto and home together and they underwrite both. So over here on the right, I ran a comprehensive loss and underwriting exchange clue report for a prospective client. And um, he has five claims, each around $2,300 or $2,400 for glass claims. So under Prop 103, He's not being charged for this on the carrier that he's been with for many years, but that carrier is now exiting the state because they can't raise their rate to offset their losses. And so now he's got these five claims that he's not at fault for, but he's not a profitable account. So our carriers all said, do not write that with us. We do not want someone who's not profitable to us coming in and, and, and dirtying our pool, you know? So you need to be very careful filing any kind of claim. And if you have a if you have a farmers or a state farm or all state, which are direct writers, you don't even want to call them before you make the, you pull the trigger on a claim because you'll end up paying everything that you paid that carrier. Everything the carrier pays you, in my experience, you'll pay it back unless it's a massive claim. Like if it's something that's going to, you know, you you absolutely have to file because it's a financial issue, but, uh, you know, you have to file it. But when you're talking about, uh, you know, a BMW windshield that has high tech in it, and you want two or the three of those, you know, you want one of those every year, the carriers just aren't going to do that anymore. These, the days of filing casual claims are over. Um, uh, Brian, I've got a quick question yeah. on that one. Do you have a rough rule of thumb that you give guidance on if it's because we grew up being used to deductibles to kind of guide our yeah. our claiming. But these days, I know when I'm talking to clients, I'll say even though your deductible might be $1,500, maybe something 
above 5,000 or 10,000 is what you should be thinking about because of the repercussions. Well, on a home, on a home, you have to have a five or $10,000 deductible. If, if you're below that, you're, you're, you're going to file a claim and then lose your insurance. So, yeah. you know, you get, I mean, you get a 30, $40,000 claim in most people need to use insurance for that. Right. So it really depends on the value of the home, the, the net worth of the client, that sort of thing. But my rule of thumb would be if you can afford to sustain it, sustain it because you, you end up, I've had people go from paying, you know, $3,000 a year or $4,000 a year for their home insurance to paying $20,000 a year for their home insurance because they had two bikes stolen out of their house on two different occasions. And the carrier said, Hey, too many theft claims. We're going to cancel you. And the only place we could put it was in fair plan. And that's ridiculous pricing. So you know, so, you know, we have all these things, adding requirements, there's leak detection, supply lines, they're saying, hey, we want new supply lines. So carriers are going in and doing active risk management. They're calling existing business that you might have heard of the flyovers. Like these are real. We've had, we have three of these a week in our agency where there's discoloration on the roof or there's water pooling that we can see or debris or cars in the backyard, whatever it is, the carriers are looking to drop people. This house here, they had to trim back all these trees. You see there's trees overhanging the roof. That's bad for a roof. It causes decay and the carrier said, fix that and then take a picture so we know that the shingles aren't damaged. And another client had leaves on their roof for a long time. They had to replace the whole roof because of the discoloration, the decay on the roof. They said, have to, it has to go. So then we've got, this is something very important, unexpected maintenance costs. You've got, you know, non-renewals coming from buying, when you're buying and selling property. And a lot of people are kind of caught holding the bag. So here's what's going on. A lot of agents, you know, will get a call from a real estate agent and they'll say, oh, we want to get insurance and they do business with those people. So they're dummying up quotes, right, to get to sell business. And then the carrier goes out, you own this home, the carrier goes out and they say, hey, when was this roof actually replaced? And the, the homeowner's like, I don't know. Then they take a drone picture of it and it shows discoloration or wear of the granulation on the roof. And now the carrier comes back and says, hey, you have to replace this roof or we're going to non-renew you. You are uninsurable if you're flying under the flag of a non-renewal for a roof. There's not a single carrier in the country that will write a, a house under non-renewal. So that means you have to replace the roof. So if you bought the house and the agent who, who you hired to sell you the insurance just pretended that the roof was okay so they could sell the policy, you could end up having to pay for a roof. And then we're finding that people now are trying to sell homes. You know, there's a house um, my brother wanted to buy and all the offers coming in are, hey, you need to upgrade the electrical, you need to upgrade the roof, you need to upgrade all these home systems. So these homes are starting to look a lot like buying a used car. How many miles are on this roof? How many miles are on this electrical? If there's any knob and tube wiring, old style knob and tube like wiring or non-Romex wiring, the carrier is going to come out and, and cancel that policy. This stuff, is, these things are real. And so people, the value of homes is actually being affected by this because I'm not going to buy a home that's inflated because of the school district and the neighborhood and everything, and then turn around and spend $500,000 trying to replace the roof and the electrical. I want, I'm going to say the house is devalued and that's starting to happen with this insurance crisis because the tensions and the carriers and the losses that they've been taking are so high that the carriers have put a lot more money into inspections and, 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 um, so you, you have to be very careful. That warning in red is people are still acting lackadaisical. I had a real estate agent ask me about a house the other day. Isn't there anything creative that we can do? And I said, well, if create by creative, do you mean lie? I don't do that because, you know, it's called a material omission or fraud. And if I commit fraud, I lose my license to practice. And in your carrier, if, if there's fraud on the count, if, if you said the roof was less than 20 years old and they come out and it shows all this wear and tear, they may not pay a claim. The carriers are not going to pay claims on things that they think are fraudulent. So 
These are very important things to understand when you're buying and selling homes or the home you have right now may have some issues on it that you may have to confront if you go to sell. Um, so be prepared for maintenance costs and purchasing property and avoid them. We've actually had a couple of our clients that were buying houses bail on the bail on the deal because it needed a new roof. And it's funny because then the new, now they had to say why the house fell out of escrow, right? Uh, on the next thing. So the, the, the people came back on that deal and said, okay, we decided that we're going to fund the new roof because they couldn't sell the house now that it fell out of escrow because of a bad roof. So these things are starting to get really serious now. So, what, so the big question is, what do I need to know? And um, you're going to have to spend some time learning that insurance decisions are very important. There's an, op there's an opaque nature to insurance that is fully on the carriers. Um, they have their part in this too. So when I'm talking about, you know, Ricardo Laura, He's done a terrible job, but they've also done a terrible job in having people understand what they're buying. And I don't think it's fair the way insurance is sold. Uh, and I think that we need to do more about that. But it, it hasn't happened despite all my um, all my uh, grousing about it. But the process of shopping for insurance is advertising and humor. And, you know, I'll save you some money. Usually if I'm going to save you money, it means I have to take away a coverage, right? But you may not know what that coverage is if I'm not disclosing it to you. This should be a law that I have to disclose a coverage that's being taken away. People don't have useful information, so they just buy some insurance and they move on with their lives because this is really complicated. I mean, my wife will spend, you know, a couple of hours trying to decide what she's going to buy off Amazon because she can read the reviews and understand them. But my wife doesn't want to know that much about insurance, you know? So this, this is what the insurance business really looks like. At one end, you have a, you have a dollar sign. At the other end, you have uh, the three dollar signs. Down on the left side, it's very lean coverage, very limited coverage and inexpensive generally. And over here at the other end, you have these really super great policies that if something happens, someone just shows up at your house with a check and they're like, hey, we're really sorry, you know, here's some money. And in between, you have what's called the middle market. The middle market is State Farm and Safeco and farmers and everything. And these guys have created statistical probability models on their policies to give you what the average person needs when they file a claim. And so when I say 5K is sewer, they say, hey, you know what? If someone has a little bit of sewer backup, you know, we'll pay up to $5,000 for it. This is my number one cause of loss in my insurance agency from inception. If you took total property losses, not by number, but by sheer volume of dollar, sewer backup is my number one cause of loss because of how much it costs to remediate hazmat materials. Anything that comes out of a drain is hazmat. So... You know, they say, oh, we'll do this or we'll give you 20 to 50 percent. You know, in the 2017 fires, the extended replacement costs, we were looking at 180 percent of value, 190 percent. So what happens is these carriers have designed these statistical models. And I'll go into what some of this stuff means in just a minute. It's hard to see, but I wanted you to see the diagram. If you have a claim that falls inside of their statistical probability model, they'll pay it in nine out of 10 or eight and a half out of 10 or whatever claims are going to fall under this middle market average claim. And you won't even know that you were in danger. On the outside of that curve, where it says sublimits protect carrier, that's where the carriers protect themselves with limitations on how they pay, how they settle claims, the types of losses that they're going to pay and the amounts of money that you're going to get. So when I hear a carrier on when I'm watching like you know football and they say nine out of ten of our you know clients customers are satisfied I'm like that means that for every ten people there's one of them who has a statistical outlier claim that ended up paying out hundreds of thousands of dollars that's dissatisfied right but that's how the nine out of ten satisfied customers things work so. Be advised that carriers have been disingenuous about this too. And I think they need to be brought to task for this. And they're in their lane. They don't, they want to complain, but they don't want to be responsible or force insurance agents to 
take on more of a role like a financial advisor where, you know, if a financial advisor is exposing you to risk, they're obligated to tell you and have you sign a document that says that. I don't have to do that. You can call my agency and I can basically sell you anything I want as a salesman and not get in trouble for it. I don't, but I could, and people do. So here's what you need to know about the invisible moving parts. Replacement cost versus actual cash value. How will your loss be settled is a very important question. Replacement cost is if you have uh, something damaged, I buy you a new one of those, or I give you the money to buy a new one of those. Actual cash value is I give you an appreciated value. So a $200 pair of shoes at Nordstrom, what is the value of those shoes at Goodwill if I give them the Goodwill? I might be able to walk in and pay $10 for the same shoes. So when you're talking about depreciation, you're talking about getting less than the value of replacement cost. How does that policy work? That's You have to read the policy or someone has to read it for you and tell you what that is. Um, building ordinance or law is very important. This governs construction. So if you have a house that was built even in, uh, I'm gonna give you an example of a house from 1998. The energy uh, code on the windows is different. The seismic code is different. He has to put solar sprinklers. If that house is damaged in a fire, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of dollars of building ordinance or law. Does the carrier pay that? Carriers know they have to rebuild to new code, and a lot of them put a limitation on this. It's a, called a sublimit. So these moving parts are very important. Extended replacement cost is an inflation hedge. It says, okay, if you have a million dollar house and we have 150% extended replacement costs, we're gonna rebuild in a demand surge where there's a large loss out to 1.5 million. Well, in 2017, in those fires that we've had in California, I've seen most of those houses rebuilding at 1.8 to 1.9 million, uh, you know, 180 to 190% of their value. So 150% is a statistical average that gives the carrier a hedge that you might not be able to rebuild that house. Where are you going to come up with another three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars cash to rebuild your house? They know that you don't have that money, most people. This is their largest asset. You can't just pull that out of a 401k. You have to pay tax on it. Sewer and water backup, I already talked about that. It's common exclusion. Many carriers don't cover this. Uh, it's very important to ask. And, and there's one here, personal injury. This is libel, slander. It's false arrest. It's um, if your kid gets into a texting match with another kid at their school and the parents sue, uh, there's been a lot of lawsuits with children in their iPhones and Snapchat about saying things about each other or posting inappropriate photos and things like that. That's personal injury. And the reason personal injury is not on 80% of the policies that we look at this is a liability coverage, is because carriers know that. In 2004, all, a lot of the middle market carriers started dropping personal injury from their policy form because people were suing each other over their kids and their, their restaurant reviews and saying mean things to each other on Facebook and Instagram and you, know, you name it. Um, people, people's ability to publish their opinions has caused a lot of lawsuits. And so this has gone away. But if it, you can add it back in, and it's like a $25 endorsement on most policies, but agents don't know what it is. They don't even know it's not there. If, if an agent says that you don't need personal injury because you have medical payments, then you need to fire that person and go find someone who knows what personal injury is because um, it's a very specific coverage that you need on every homeowner insurance policy, a renter's policy, a condo policy. Anywhere you live where you have liability insurance, this is important, particularly if you have kids. I'm sure all of your kids are really smart and don't get in any trouble. Both my kids are idiots and uh, cannot wait to be an empty nester. I'm like two years away and I'm tired of kids. I want to go work at a dog shelter. So anyway, but enough about me and my kids. So here's the last couple of slides. And this is how we track the moving parts. So like, how do I track all this stuff? I have a handout that I've given that talks about the ordinance and law stuff and personal injury and sewer backup. So you can use that. 
I use Excel in my practice because I like to track the things that make a difference. And I have some arrows here that I'm going to talk about mostly, but there's little things like who, who has title to the property, right? If you have a trust that owns your home, you should name the trust as an additional insurer. If you've put it in an LLC, the LLC needs to be a named insured. Like whoever has insurable interest needs to be on the policy. We track premium. I mean, this is a case where we work with a client and we move them from one carrier to another and they went from 2071 to 2772 um, in premium. We raised their premium, but we gave them different coverage. I'll explain about that in a minute, but home form. Every policy has what's called a policy form. A homeowner's form is an HO3 or an HO5. Condo forms have their forms. I ask what form it is because if you buy the wrong form, the carrier doesn't have to pay you. So you really need to know what, if you, if you lived in one house, for instance, bought another house and you have a rental, but you still have that rental on a homeowner policy, it should be on a dwelling policy. So if it's rented to others and it's not disclosed to the insurance carrier and there's a loss, they may not pay you. So knowing what you need, knowing where your policy form, what your policy form is important. This is a primary residence that we track use. So I know homeowner is the right one. They had earthquake coverage. I'm not gonna talk about earthquake today. Um, their policy de deductible was $1,000. Way too low, don't file $1,000 claims. This is telling an insurance carrier, cancel me, cancel me. Because if you file a small claims, they know a bigger claim is coming. The insurance industry has a saying, experience leads to severity. We always believe that small claims lead to large claims and um, disorganization and non-payment, everything, you know, debris on roofs, all of those things are actuarially tied to claims. Don't show cards that show danger. When you do that, you lose your insurance. We raised their deductible to $10,000. I would do more if it was a larger house. He was insured, the house is 1998, so we know there's some code issues already. It's 3,800 square feet, so we know it's kind of nice inside. When you get above you know, 2,500 square feet, you start getting some specialty items in homes. So we start looking at that. The guy had him insured for 677,000 on this house at $176 a foot. Um, that wouldn't build anything in California. We bumped it to $400 a square foot and we raised the premium or raised the replacement cost to 1.5 million. He was underinsured by 862,000. He was underinsured by more than he was insured for. That means that he's not going to be able to rebuild this house with an insurance policy. So what happens? Well, here's his settlement options. It's rebuild or ACV. So we'll replacement cost here on the 677,000. Or if you're not going to rebuild, we're only going to give you actual cash value. So now his 677 goes down to like maybe 400 or 350,000 replacement cost. And they're going to pay him out in a check because he's underinsured. And I don't know that if he has $862,000 in the bank to build his house, maybe he did. I know he didn't because I asked him. But maybe. Right? So these are very important policy we replaced it with, we'll give him 1.5 million if the house burns down, we'll build it out to 1.5 million, or we'll build it out to 3 million extended replacement costs. So his underinsured home had 150% extended replacement costs, which would have gone out to a million. Now you have to show that there's a demand surge. You can't just use extended replacement costs. This You have to show cause to be able to invoke that clause of the, of the policy. So he had up to a million if there was like a wildfire, but he, there's not going to be a wildfire where he lives. So this would have been irrelevant, but we put in a 200% extended replacement cost because if the house burns down while there's hurricanes and other places, we may have a demand surge across the country that we need to address this. So I like to have at least, you know, 200% extended replacement cost if I can get it. 150 is the next best thing, but anything below that, you're almost certainly not gonna be able to rebuild your house. Um, California has been in a demand surge for years, since 2017, and all these hurricanes that you just saw, 
Every time something big happens in the United States, demand surge goes up across the entire country because contractors and professionals start moving around because they can make a lot of money in these damaged areas. So know this, like Florida's woes are going to be our woes if you have to rebuild a house in San Francisco in the next couple of years. So you've got these moving parts. Then we go to the next section, building ordinance or law limits. I track those. So he had 10% on that. So on his underinsured home, he only had $67,000 towards building ordinance or law. So if there was a fire in that house, the first thing the fire department does is they go through the house and they break out all the windows. They destroy the windows because they want to create airflow and they want to be able to put water through the windows and they have egress points for the um, for the firefighters. So just the energy efficient windows on a 3,800 square foot house are going to run something on the order of $50,000 and they're going to be the, not the windows that the carrier wants to put in. So that's building ordinance or law plus sprinkler system plus energy efficient wiring. This is totally underinsured. We had no uh, sublimit on the policy that we did in full coverage. So it doesn't matter if it's 1.5 to rebuild, if we have to put in some sprinklers or whatever, we'll do it because that's what the carrier does. Now he's paying more money. We raised his premium by about seven or $800, but we also raised his deductible to $10,000. So we, off, we offset our cost increase by raising the deductible. On a larger home, I would have gone to 20000 or 50000 If you're living in a house that's worth $4 million and you have a $10,000 deductible, that's pretty low. On a $1.5 or a million dollar home, well, we keep the deductibles commiserate with what people can probably afford to sustain in terms of a loss. And if it's and if a loss is big to you, it's big. I mean, like, you know, not everyone, you know, is a billionaire. But you need to be thinking strategically about how you're going to pay losses and how you're going to file claims. I am always willing to have a conversation with someone about this type of stuff. I don't care if you buy insurance from us. Like if you've got something going on and you want to have someone to ask a question to that's a third party that does nothing to do with you. I do this all the time. I do it for the Financial Planner Association um, and their foundation. I think it's very important for people to have someone to ask a question to that that doesn't have something to gain from it. So, you know, know this, if you have my information and you want to call and ask a question, I'm always happy to answer them. It doesn't cost me anything to, to be kind. Um, and then down here, here's our personal injury, you know, where the kids can cause lawsuits and, you know, people are going to sue for mental anguish and it's excluded on his policy, which I knew it would be because it is on 80% or 90% of the policies that I look at. Um, so we added personal injury to the to the policy and bumped his liability up to a million. And we put an umbrella over that. And um, the last thing on this really, so we track if you have employees. So these people had a nanny working for them and um, they didn't have any workers comp. In California, if you have someone working in your household full time, if you just have some mow and blow guys come into your house or like a landscaper, that's no problem. You know, if you have a house cleaner coming in once or twice a week or every two weeks, no problem. But if you get a nanny working with your kids, that person is a household employee and you have to have workers comp for them. Same thing for caregivers, people who are working in your home. California is very strict on work comp. If you don't have that and California finds out about it, they're going to skewer you if they get injured. You have to pay for their injuries out of pocket. So if nanny falls down your stairs and she goes to the hospital and so they're going to say, hey, was there an accident or an injury? And she's going to be like, yeah, I fell down the stairs at my employer's house. The hospital is going to start a chain of events that's going to cause everyone to sue each other. So just know that um, this is a question we always ask. But, you know, you're welcome to copy this or I can you know give copy of it but I like Excel for this type of thing because then you can track hey is there sewer backup is there building ordinance or law what's my cost per foot on this house if, you're ha if you live in San Francisco and your house is you know insured at under $400 a foot you're underinsured for sure because I've built a lot of houses in San Francisco and I know how much it costs so it, even if you're just a regular house I mean, we insure everything in San Francisco from like 550 a foot up to 4,000 a foot. 
you know, you can spend as much money as you want as you start importing marble and stuff from Italy, but not everyone does that. And so we have to find out what's in the house and give a reasonable replacement cost, but you want to be insured the value. Most insurance carriers use a minimum value calculator. So they'll come up and say, okay, we think this is X. And what they're saying is that's your minimum insurance that you have to buy, but it's not necessarily what the true value is. So you have to be very careful letting a insurance carrier run its value estimator because a lot of them are skewed lower because the carriers, you'd think the carriers wanted it to be more because um, they can charge you more premium, but they actually want it to be less so that you're not going to have to rebuild your home. And I mean, that's my years of experience. And, you know, the carriers really have rigged this in a lot of ways, some of them. Now you can buy full policies from carriers, a lot of them, you know, that will rebuild a home, but you have to know what to ask for. Because again, a lot of insurance agents are running around trying to sell policies and they're trying to be the cheapest one. So they're cheaper by pulling out coverage. Well, if I take out building ordinance or law and sewer backup, I might save you 50% on your, um, on your premium. That looks pretty good if I just give you a PDF document that says, hey, these two carriers are this. But if you don't know that those things are not there anymore, when you have a loss, and those are the two most likely types of loss, you're going to be disappointed in how the in how the um, claim falls out, and it won't be in your favor. And and this is the issue that I think Ricardo Loro was trying to get at with the laws that he was trying to pass. But he did it without really understanding how the insurance business works and where the carriers needed to be pressured. And so, you know, he's working at one angle; they're working at another angle, and the consumer advocates are working at their angle. Um, really somebody needs to walk in there and be appointed and fix everything. Like if, if, if someone like me, who's an expert on retail insurance, got appointed at the department of insurance, they could fix this thing in about six months and everyone would hate them. The insurance carriers would hate them. The consumers would hate them. The media would hate them. Everyone would hate them. So that person can't be going to run for an office, right? But they have to be willing to do what it takes to fix this and run it like a business. And so, um, you know, I don't know who's going to do it, but it's it's not going to be me. <laughs> no one seems to like my version of it when they're in politics or consumer advocates or whatever. So... Um, that was the last slide I had. Does anyone um, have questions? We do have some questions, Brian. There's one that yeah. came in earlier. And this is at, um, a person asking, if you request a stronger coverage of insurance, is there a likelihood that you could be dropped? And in his, pers in his particular case, he lives in Antioch near Dry Hills. Mm -hmm. So... Um, I would call and couch the discussion in terms of, I wanna have a conversation about my replacement costs and some of these coverages that I have. You know, is it possible? I wanna make sure that these are all good. And in Antioch, um, I would say a house out there should be insured for between 300 and 400 a foot. Um, the houses out there are um, like a lot of KB home, and um, Pulte. And so if your house is an attract out there, the, 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 they had semi custom, right? You could buy, um, you know, engineered wood and nice cabinets and granite and all that stuff, but it's, it's, it was bought at, in bulk. So the, so they're, it's pretty easy to replace. So probably, you know, 300 to 400 a foot, depending on what you put in the house. And I would ask, I would call and just ask them about it and say, Hey, is this good? I don't think they're going to cancel you for wanting to be insured to value. And if your deductible is, you know, a thousand or two thousand, raise it to five or ten thousand, because really, you you don't want to be filing a claim under ten thousand dollars. And I would get rid of any of the. If you're out in Antioch, the carriers that are running out there, a lot of them they're selling equipment breakdown and things like that. I've never had an equipment breakdown um, claim in California 
in Arizona or some places where we have a lot of lightning, you know, you'll get your whole HVAC system fried on your roof with lightning, but it doesn't happen in California. So I'd get rid of those things too. But I don't think they're going to drop you for that. And Antioch is a, the, those rolling hills, they're worried more about smoke damage than they are about wildfire. Thank you for that. Now we have a question uh, about that is a paragraph or a statement that appears on an auto policy. I do not sure. understand this statement, so I'm going to read it to you. All right. Drivers do not necessarily correspond to principally operated vehicle. Yeah. So what that means is if let's say you have four household members and you have um, four automobiles, a company like Safeco is going to assign your highest rated driver to your lowest rated car. So if you have a 2007 Prius and a 16 year old and a BMW and an 18 year old, they're going to assign the they're going to assign the higher rated drivers to the lower rated cars to save you money. So when they give you a driver list one two three four, you also have an auto list one two three four, and they're saying that any driver can drive any car, but the drivers in their one, two, three, four are not necessarily the auto of one, two, three, four. So there's nothing ominous, ominous about it. It's just telling you that the drivers could be assigned in any way. And some carriers will assign the highest rated driver to the highest rated car. So if you have a Porsche in the house and a 16 year old, they're gonna put the 16 year old on the Porsche. So um, that's expensive by the way, putting a kid in a high performance car is um, expensive, yeah. I would think so. Yeah. <laughs> Not I mean, a good maybe, idea overall. Well, I, like I said, my kids are stupid, so. <laughs> that is not true. We're not going to accept it, that. No. Um, I think that that's most of the questions that came in during the presentation. We do still have some more time if somebody has some specific uh, questions. Or Brian, if you want to share any other bits of wisdom. I, I just wanted to... Um, to add that I found after being non-renewed, the process of trying to get new insurance was, okay, opaque is probably a good word. It made yeah. no sense whatsoever. And the the questions that were we were being asked to basically, or, or even the tasks we were being given to do seemed like it was just to be an impediment to us continuing to ask for insurance. Well, the carriers are asking for a lot. They want to know when things were updated. Um, they, they're they running a lot of reports. I mean, so there's different carriers have different, you know, like travelers, for instance, if the house is older, they're, um, they're having, they're saying, hey, you can't have insurance unless a contractor goes in and, and confirms that all the home systems are functioning and adequate to the house. So contractor is not going to do that. Is not going to say yes unless it is because he doesn't want to get sued. So there's all these things that they're doing, or we want a roof inspection. If you have a tile roof, a tile roof should have a roof inspection every two years. Every roof should be inspected every two years. But tile roofs, there's a lot of flashings. You know, tile roofs can last a long time, but you have to know your flashings are okay. So the carriers are doing that. And then there's there's access to the markets. Like so we had to, my staff was everyone is very upset because people are calling us and asking for help and we're not able to provide help for everyone who, who calls. And so um, we had to come up with a triage uh, protocol. So our triage is if an existing client is losing coverage, any allocations that we have from the carriers go to them first. So we take care of our, our existing clients first, and then we take care of, um, people who come to us from financial firms with whom we already have re relationships. And then it's other people who we, I know from, you know, FPA or whatever, and then it's the general public. So there's very little left over for people just calling the agency to get insurance because we don't have a lot of capacity anymore because the carriers aren't riding much. So there's that too. And I, I had to put that policy in place because this is a human business, right? So, um, you know, the people who work for me 
get attached to our clients and the underwriters who are having to tell us no or send us these aerial photos, it's very difficult for them emotionally to be delivering this bad news on a daily basis. So there's, you know, people forget sometimes that this is a the, the human portion of this business and how people are being, um, how people are feeling. And there's a blame the victim thing going on too. Like, so I had an underwriter tell me yesterday they weren't going to do the Oakland thing and, and um, they weren't going to write a house in Oakland because of the crime. And, and he, you know, he kind of, you know, he kind of made it their fault. And I'm not going to say that I haven't done the same thing. Right. Cause sometimes I'll say, Hey, you know what, this California thing, everyone kind of voted for it. Right. Like it's, and but but no one knew what they were voting for. No one knew the trouble that we were going to get into. And so I, I think a lot of times um, people are trying to defend their mental integrity, if that makes any sense, right? Like there's people who are very who are really nice people in this industry who are really upset having to deliver this bad news that they're giving on a daily basis to people. So um, we. You know, I, I I had a conversation with another underwriter. And I said, hey, look, man, I know I know that this is hard on you sending this to us, but I want you to know that we're working with you. We're working with the people on these aerial photos and we're explaining why it's important. And and we're, we're just going to all get through it together. And he was he was very appreciative of the call. So I think we I think we all have to. In, I mean, I'm not always kind in my criticisms of the powers that be because I'm frustrated. But I mean, if there was something, everyone wants to help people. I think most people are um, well intentioned, and so, um, you know, I would I would ask questions. If you're calling to get insurance, ask questions like, "Do you guys have capacity? Are you able to help?" I, I totally understand if you can only work with existing clients or whatever, but you might get to answers faster by asking questions like hey look are you guys accepting new clients can you accept new clients do you have any clients that are that are um uh writing business in this area i mean that that might be a that might be a good place to start because that gives them an opening to say well you know then you're having a human conversation versus uh you know a guy called our agency two days ago and he got my office manager and he's like, well, I'm going to give you my address. She's like, what's your name? He's like, you don't need to know that to quote. And and she was like, that's the wrong answer. <laughs> like, you know, you're wrong about that. And I'm not going to fight with you about this. And so she just extricated herself from the call. But I mean, he was trying to hold his cards close to the vest because he was afraid that someone was going to take advantage of him. And, and she's like working at light speed. And so that clash was unpleasant for everybody. So I don't know if there's wisdom there or not, but you know, I like, I do yoga every day to try to keep myself calm in the midst of this storm, because it's the only way to stay sane. Right. <laughs> so. Brian, I love that. Kindness matters. <laughs> it absolutely does. Um, so we've got a question over here, and this is something I personally ran into as well. Um, mm -hmm. He's saying that most ho homes in San Francisco, and this can be uh, outside of San Francisco as well, are built in the 50s or before with knob and tube. Mm -hmm. I actually met with a contractor to talk about what do you do to move around knob and two, and he did not have good answers. But I'm wondering if you have some answers. And this person um, references the cost to upgrade to Romex wiring. Yeah, Romex is the standard wiring. It's a it's a sheathed wiring, so it's in a it's in a plastic, waterproof, damage proof. Um, well, rats can eat it, but and they do. Um, but aside from that. It, it is, there are no good answers on the knob and tube because it's inside. If there's knob and tube on that house and it's, and it's the 1940s, you might have lath and plaster walls too. So now you're talking about opening up walls to replace wiring. And um, it can be very difficult to fish wires through those walls because you don't know what's in them and you have 
small attic space. I mean, the process of upgrading the knob and tube wiring is extremely difficult and expensive. Um, and it's going to have to be done because there's no carriers. I mean, if you've got a carrier on the house now and they haven't non-renewed you, you'll probably be okay. But if you go to sell the house, like travelers, for instance, they won't write a house with knob and tube wiring. They won't even write a house that has knob and tube wiring that's abandoned. It has to be completely removed. None. And the same thing, the carriers that will see it, if they do an inspection, it's exactly the same thing because it's so volatile. I mean, we just had one, the guy um, submitted an application, a non-emitted carrier. Um, non-emitted carriers are carriers that don't file their rates with the state of California. So they have more leeway on how they insure, but they'd already had a fire in the wall due to wiring. So the whole house was knob and tube and we just couldn't do it. The knob and tube can't, carry the load, the modern electrical load is about 150 amps on a regular family with all of our electronics devices. Like I don't, I have, you know, two phones, an iPad, a Surface Pro and a computer all tied in at one time. And so does my wife and then my kids have all their crap. So, I mean, we're using a lot of combined electricity and that's what's happening with the knob and tube it wasn't designed to draw that much amperage it was just lights and a radio and everyone would sit around and talk with each other so it's a big problem and it and all of those 1940s houses and you know it's the first thing we ask is there any knob and tube wiring because we're, we're almost dead in the water now with, without it and, but I would look around for contractors who are experts on that because, some, you know, if they've gotten good at doing it, replacing, like there's there's um, plumbers that are experts on replacing the, the galvanized pipe with um, copper or PEX. And there's uh, San Francisco code, you still have to use um, cast iron on the, on the sewer pipes, but the, um, but you can, you know, there's there's contractors that are specialists on that too. So I would I would be asking friends, who do you know who does this? And um, I can, you know, I've got a I've got a couple plumbers that I use in San Francisco. Um, there's a guy at um, it's called Renstrom Plumbing, um, R E N N S T R O M Renstrom Plumbing. He's been in business for a really long time, and he's a good guy. Like I. If I were going to replumb, I would I would call someone like him. And I don't have any, you know, he's not like my cousin or anything. He's just a guy that I've done a lot of work for my clients over the years. And, uh, you know, and I would see if there's an electrical contractor who understands how to do that. Because some people are going to be more efficient than others. There may be ways of doing it that um, not everyone... Not everyone will make you tear everything out, but opening up walls is very expensive when you're talking about lath and plaster and replacing with sheetrock and that kind of stuff. Thank you. I'm for sorry, that. I don't. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a better answer. But yeah, and I'm hoping something's going to evolve here. Um, the last question should be fairly simple because we're running up on time. If you fear that there's been an insurance fraud, who do you contact? Um. When? Well, it depends on what kind of fraud. Like so. Um, if I, I would need some clarification on that. Yeah. Like, and, and I don't know. So if it's an agent who's committed fraud, um, that's the department of insurance. They're pretty strict about that. I will say, um, Ricardo Laura has done a pretty good job on that in prosecuting agents, um, who are, who are, uh, criminals. Okay, if Brian, uh, we just got clarification. Contractor fraud. Oh, contractor fraud. I guess that would be related to fixing with insurance money. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, if a contractor is committing insurance fraud, letting the insurance carrier know that will um, will cause a cascade of problems for that guy because it's a very serious it's a very serious um, accusation and a serious crime. And a contractor can lose their license. I mean, it's a big deal to commit fraud as a contractor. Um, a lot of them will try it. Like on a claim, they'll say, oh, yeah, you know, we can say this, but we can do this other thing. So you have to be careful of it. Um, 
In a claim, what usually happens is you reach an agreement with the carrier on how to start doing something. So they come out and they do a assessment and the contractor, the carrier and you say, okay, this is what we're gonna do. And then when, once you open up the wall, you're like, hey, we have to change this because of X. And then the carrier says, okay, it's a process of discovery. So in that process, sometimes the contractors try to elevate risk, you know, elevate their costs and things like that. So um, watching it is, is important because, but most people don't, don't know how to rebuild a house. So it's mostly the contractor. Yeah. Well, we are out of time. I want to say thank you so much to Brian, as always. Um, you're just a wealth of information. Very much appreciate your time. Um, the library also, fantastic host for the past 10 years for these financial planning yeah, days. Thanks. And Brian does other presentations through the library. Um, I know that Ramon from the library posted his sublimits talk, which people love. I just love it when somebody comes up to me and says, I loved a conversation about <laughs> sublimits in insurance. That's a good day. Um, so thank you to everyone. <laughs> That's last, funny. I know. That's really funny. The things that we love. Um, our last presentation is going to be an update on tax with Larry Pond. And uh, Ramon, do you have anything that you need to cover? No, just thank you, um, Brian, for all the information. Thank you, Chris, for monitoring the chat and answering all the questions. Um, and thank you for to all the participants and everyone who's joined us today. Um, I will be sending a follow up email with the with a survey with um, uh, some information that Brian has provided uh, and the recording. So please look forward to that. And thank you very much again. Um, we've reached the end. Thank you. It's always it's always fun to see you, Chris and Ramon. So thanks, guys.